All right, let's, let's go ahead and get started. So the, the topic for the next 50 minutes is RHEL versus Fedora, well, where RHEL diverged and why. So as Denise mentioned previously, RHEL is derived from Fedora primarily, and uh, that, that generally means that we do things in Fedora first, and then we inherit them in RHEL. And in some cases, we end up doing things in RHEL first, and then we try to sort out what to do in Fedora after. So this is that latter case that we're talking about. So first of all, this is a panel. So I would like to introduce our panelists. We have Denise Dumas, who presented just moments ago. Uh, <laughs> Paul Frields, rock star, former pro <laughs> Fedora project lead, and uh, also Mr. Rel7. And Alexandra Fedorova, <laughs> part of FESCO, and CI hacker extraordinaire. And I'm the new Paul Frields for Rel8. And uh, Rel8's my baby. It's definitely not a stale distribution, Neil. So let's, let's talk about what we're talking about today. So there's basically four things we're going to cover. Uh, background for anybody who hasn't been through a new Rel release before. Uh, the things that we actually changed inside when we were making the new rail release, uh, how we're doing updates, like kind of the, how we keep it stable, and then what the opportunities are for reconciling those last two things with what happens in Fedora. So let's talk about like the Rail 8 origin story. First of all, Rail 8 Alpha was derived from Fedora 27. It's kind of like the first pancake. It tastes pretty good, but it's also sort of funny looking. And... Uh, <laughs> Generally, you just throw that one away, and that's what we did. So really, RHEL 8 is fundamentally derived from Fedora 28. That's where the RHEL 8 beta came from. It, it, it's delicious. And 8GA will become, will move to 8.1 beta, 8.1 beta will become 8.1GA, 8.1GA will become 8.2 beta, and basically that's just the case of us taking upstream patches, applying them to the sources we already have, and releasing it. So we, we get a nice stack uh, that way. And it, it has the unfortunate side effect, though, that when we do this, we actually stop inheriting from Fedora most of the time. So before RHEL 8 came out uh, a couple months ago, we hadn't really done a mass import from Fedora since 2014. So it had been a while. And uh, we, we've actually taken some measures inside 8 to make it conceivably possible that we could like, interact more often. And that's what we were really looking for. So, uh, so a few other things. Uh, Rel Previously, the schedule for it was pretty sporadic. We didn't know when the next release was going to be until the previous one was done. And uh, we've actually moved, we're, we're converging with Fedora on a six month schedule. This is like a brand new thing for us. Uh, we're still learning how to do that. Uh, basically, Fedora has a head start on us on this one. And we've also decided that we're, and announced that we're going to try to do a new major release every three years. So RHEL 9 is about two years and 10 months away now. So it's surprisingly not a lot of time left for us to like, figure out what we want to do next together and get it done. So let's talk about where, where we actually started diverging from, from Fedora. And there's just a few, a few fundamentals that are different and it, it has consequences. The first one is that the Fedora infrastructure is completely separate from the RHEL infrastructure. Different Koji builders, different Koji build system, different storage, different test equipment, different diskit, all those things are completely separate. And what that means is when we're doing that bootstrap, every single time we end up having to rebuild the world with whatever changes we do. And it's, it's kind of like a, a laborious activity for us and it, it has very little value other than that we have this separate infrastructure. So where the divergence really begins though is in package selection. Fedora is huge, it has an enormous number of packages RHEL has a very small number of packages by comparison. And there are a few things where RHEL is actually not a subset of Fedora, like the kernel. We take the spec file, but then we just pull from kernel.org because that's where most of our developers actually are living on the kernel side. And then there's a few you know, partner packages for, for enabling weird hardware that, that are still open source. But overall, a lot of it is pretty common. And uh, well, this is kind of corporate looking. All right, then Pancake. So, Fedora exclusive content, it's pretty big. Apple comes from this. Uh, we love Apple. And just overall though, 
when we take a subset of the Fedora content, we also have to change the dependency tree because everything can depend on everything. And when we, when we bootstrap, we actually have to solve all those build failures. And we end up usually doing that internally first and then pushing them back out later. Uh, hopefully the fact that we have a, a public schedule now and, and greater, greater ability to even admit that we're gonna do a rel nine, it's totally gonna happen, means that we can do things like put EL9 disk tag comparison things in spec files. So the other big change was when we did RHEL 7 and earlier, we had a compose for server, for workstation, sounds kind of familiar. We've actually done away with that. We decided, you know, it's better to just have kind of the everything compose, but we have two composes, and the, the foundation for that is we wanted to separate the operating system from the applications, because nobody actually boots RHEL or Fedora or anything just so they can boot it. It's not, it boots, ship it. Uh, it's it boots, I want to run my application, I can run my application, that's my purpose. So by having separate OS and application compose, it gives us the ability, in theory, the ability to update the operating system independent of the applications. And so this is kind of the, the, the early premise is let's th set things up so that we can get out of just the everything depends on everything uh, position we're in, which sounds kind of suspiciously like Fedora rings, right? Like uh, we, we kind of did rings, but it's not, I wouldn't say it's done yet, it's a good starting point. So the, we're just going a little bit deeper on this one. The rule that we ended up with to make this practical was that base OS cannot depend on AppStream content except at build time. AppStream can depend on at build time and runtime on base OS content. So this is the way we found uh, a tractable way to split things up, but it's not perfect. Things like Perl are still in base OS, so we want to keep working on that. But this is this is the basic idea, and it's not a new idea. It's just one that we got to work on a little bit more than uh, than had been done before. Uh, the other place is that in some cases, as I mentioned. Uh, Fedora 28 was the basis of RHEL 8. Well, Fedora 19 was the basis of RHEL 7. So can you imagine, like, you're running Fedora 19 and you do a yum update and you're Fedora 28, it would not go well. But that's kind of what our customers are, <laughs> were going to experience if we didn't do a few things to address incompatible changes. So inside Fedora, there's a most excellent change process and going from 8, 19 to 20 to 21, little gradual change is pretty reasonable. It, it works well, it seems modest, but if you are not on that update train, if you're just going from six to seven to eight, these are giant jumps. And so we had to make a few changes, a few reverts, if you will, and I just wanna cover three of them really quickly. The first one is DNF. So DNF is really cool technology. The, the soft dependencies, Weak dependencies, Boolean dependencies are outstanding. It opens up all kinds of opportunities. Uh, the ability to do modules and have parallel availability is outstanding. Uh, we still had to call the package yum because that is, like, it was fundamental to customer experience to just be able to say, install a package called yum, run the command name yum, and have that yum behave like yum3, which was rel 7's yum. Uh, there were other just minor things that happened in rel 7 that we had to revert, like, no default syslog, that made a lot of sense for Fedora, didn't make sense for us it's because of existing customer expectation. And then finally, we added this thing called Platform Python. So uh, Python 2 is going to go away someday. We've known this for a while. Uh, Python 3 is, is pretty standard now. Three or four years ago, it wasn't. And the challenge we had was we need to get everybody over to Python 3, but which Python 3? Python 2 is like, there's only one version of Python 2 anybody cares about, it's the last one. Python 3, there's a new version coming out on a very regular basis. So we added a thing called Platform Python that is the one that is used for RHEL 8 that all of our applications use that is not user bin Python. It's not user bin Python 3. It doesn't exist anywhere but in like user lib exec. And by doing this, we let our the, the people that want to build exactly for RHEL 8, i.e. The, the RHEL developers to use the platform Python, and customers who wanted to use Python for their actual application, 
to install the version of Python that worked for them. And so user bin Python could be anything in RHEL 8. We don't know. That's up to customers to use. And that's, that's the kind of direction we want to go, is giving customers the option to use the thing they want to use and not force them to use the thing that we chose to use for our own internal pragmatic reasons. So with that, I want to hand it over to Sandra. Talk about updates. OK, so uh, first of all, I would say um, testing updates and uh, stability of updates is not a new concept we introduced in RHEL 8. It's kind of was we are from the very start, and this is what Red Hat does, actually. But uh, what's interesting in uh, RHEL 8 is that um, given by the new uh, plan for a shorter release cycle and for regular release cycle, we introduced the new concept, which is CI and gating. And I hope you heard about CI and gating before and in Fedora as well. So basically what we were targeting for is to bring the testing, which uh, Red Hat does, uh, bring it uh, into earlier stages and like do it more often. So if you heard uh, the release early, release often mantra, then like here's our variant for this is test early and test often as well. So uh, this uh, goes together with uh, the effort of upstream first uh, for the tests uh, in, in as well. So we here in Fedora know about upstream first. It's uh, the concept which we use. We know the benefits. But uh, the fact is that it also works for test code uh, the same way it works for your regular applications. The, uh, possibility to bring code, uh, test code to upstream gives you the opportunity to, uh, for better maintenance, for easier maintenance, and for this test early, test often possibility. So this was one of the efforts which was introduced in RHEL 8 cycle, where uh, QE teams of RHEL uh, distribution were bringing tests to Fedora and to upstream, and uh, this was just the beginning of it, but we are looking forward to continuing that uh, path. And uh, also, like CI in gating, essentially is all about fast feedback. So we are trying to to provide feedback to those people who can act on it. So you learn about the result of your change, the feedback of of your change uh, when you do the change, and not like several months later when someone else tries to figure out whose change caused the regression. And we also provide feedback while there is still time to act on it. So the earlier, the better. And to, to implement this, we introduced the gate in the RHEL 8 development process. Uh, while we talk a lot about gating, and uh, we will be talking about gating for Fedora, people always like associate gating with a picture of a closed doors in front of them. I would uh, like to give you a different uh, mental uh, picture of, of the gate, so please don't consider it as a closed door in front of you. Consider it uh, more like the airport gate is the place where you kind of regroup and review the changes or review what you're going to do here. And this, this gives you the opportunity, like if you forget your luggage or if you forget to present for someone, you can go to duty-free shop and get something. This, uh, like, and imagine like if you check your boarding pass only after you got to your destination place. Yeah, you probably don't want that. That's why <laughs> we need gate, and this is the kind of gate we built in uh, RHEL. And uh, you probably heard that we are going to try to build something for Fedora as well. I like the idea of that gate because duty free means liquor, so that's that's great. <laughs> okay, so that was a very brief primer on the things that were that we changed, and we'd had a few ideas for things that we like to kind of come back into the community and and kind of work together on, but this is like a starting point, not these are the things that we will do. So. Uh, we're looking for some audience participation here, especially if we don't cover something you think this would be a good idea. Please, like, raise your hand and, and add in. So, just got four things basically. And the first one is when we're doing real nine development, we'd like to be able to do more of that in the public space. 
if you're a redheader, you know that there are things like, don't even put EL8 in your disk tag, uh, <laughs> like in your spec file. Like, that's silly. We, we know there's going to be a 9. And yeah, that's fine to do. But wouldn't it be cool? I wanted, Oop. I wanted to talk, yeah, I wanted yeah, to talk to this one in specific. So uh, I, I don't know if Matthew is in here. Is he in here? He's not. Okay, he has many things to do, in which I very much sympathize with as a former Fedora project leader. And so this is a topic that I feel very strongly about. Um, it is probably one of the most uncomfortable things about being the Fedora project leader is having a lot of knowledge about what's going on internally at Red Hat with our product development and not being able to share that with the community. Um, it's a very painful place to be because you want to be open and transparent with everybody about what's going on and yet there's this huge block of knowledge that you can't share which would make people's jobs and their and their uh, their contribution so much easier it's so much easier to get people to work together if they know where they're going and when they need to get there right it's a lot harder to do that when you don't have those imperatives to share and so, you know, once again, th th we kind of breezed by this a little bit earlier, and I wanted to call really strong attention to it. Um, just once more, real quick, if I could, how many people in here do not work for Red Hat? This is a, is a helpful thing to know. Great. It's, it's yet again, it's like, it's maybe not quite half and half, but it's still quite a few of you. Um, I, I would really like to call on everybody here, whether you're employed by Red Hat or not, and you, you care about Fedora, um, just try to keep this in mind. So we just released... Rel, uh, rel 8 in May, right? And so the public commitment by Red Hat is that we are going to try and turn out Rel 9 in three years. Now, we don't have a hard date for that yet. There's, you know, there's no published calendar, but the commitment is three years. So let's just think ahead and say, well, by spring or summer of 2022, you would expect to see Rel 9 uh, uh, premiere. And so I would like everybody to just be thinking about that as we have conversations in public, you know, on Fedora Devel List, you're going to hear, hear people talk about RHEL 9, and I would hope that that's, you know, this, we could kind of share this knowledge uh, around with our fellow contributors. Um, if I were Matthew, this is one of the things that would make me most happy about the coming few years, because I don't have to keep a secret about whether or not there is an EL9 or RHEL 9 that we start thinking about how the things that we're committing into Fedora affect RHEL 9. And the fact that we can have those, those conversations in public is a huge, huge step forward. Um, and I'm, I'm kind of jealous of Matthew right now because like, I never had this and I hope that doesn't really come through too badly. But yeah, I just, I just want to cry a little tear of happiness. <laughs> It really makes me happy, but but again, you know, just keep these things in mind as we're having those conversations on the devel list. You know that that some folks obviously are going to be driven by their uh, the fact that they're thinking about what does this mean to rel nine. Well, if rel nine comes out in the spring or summer of 2022, that means that at some point prior to that, you know, we've got to do freezes. There's got to be testing that's happening inside Red Hat. Some of those things are going to be. Uh, a lot of those things we're trying to push out into upstream first, like Alexandra is talking about. Then there are always going to be a few things that are going to be Red Hat value adds that are going to happen internally, of course. I think everybody would expect that, but we're trying to you know, kind of constrain what those things look like, right? And the fact that there is you know, some time ahead of that means that you know, from right now, we probably have, I don't know, maybe two years at most to get things into Fedora to make sure that they make it into RHEL 9. So hopefully people are thinking about that. When you see somebody introduce a change, you'll be thinking about the fact that they're, you know, they're trying to also do you know, right by upstream. They're also trying to do right by what's happening internally to respond to customer needs for RHEL because remember Fedora is the upstream for RHEL and we want that to, to continue being the case for you know, the time, time to come. So I think that's all I had to say. I'm just really happy that we can be more open about it, right? Because for a long time, um, we weren't, well, as you say, we weren't able to even talk about what the schedule was going to be for the next row. And now it's good. We're out there, right? And I, we want to be more open. We want to be more transparent. I'm really excited to see more of the tests moving upstream. I think that's huge because that benefits Fedora. Yes. Yeah, and just rounding that out, like, we know about Usually there's about six months between beta and general availability. It's usually about six months between alpha and beta. So if you, if you just assume that we're going to do a cookie cutter repeat of eight, 
you could probably guess the right Fedora version, but you know, depending on how things go with, with gating, if like if rawhide is suddenly a very stable source of of trees because we have most excellent gating, maybe it's not really uh, what Fedora release are we derived from, it's like, what day of rawhide are we derived from? We don't know, we're, we're, we're gonna figure that out together. Uh, the one thing that is certain is that we like to do more of it in public, more of it shared, and if we could somehow construct a way that we don't have to like redo a bootstrap of alpha and throw it away, a bootstrap of beta in private and actually just have all that happen up front, that would mean that uh, you'd get earlier insight and uh, we'd also have have like Apple immediately because those packages would have already been built. So there's a lot of cool potential there. We want to explore it. So that's the first one. Second one is let's uh, let's do Venn diagram pancake. Uh, rings 2.0 9,000. Uh, so the <laughs> when we <laughs> um, I'm going to dwell on this. So. When we split the operating system from the application, such as we have, we were trying to address the too fast, too slow problem. Matthew talked about it yesterday. We've been talking about it for years. Uh, for our customer base, usually what, what people want is a much slower, smaller, steadier operating system, and then really rapid application deployment, like from, from upstream to to their DNF repo or, or container host, in, as quickly as possible, and that's what a lot of like, the, the development went into eight is about. Like, uh, modules are fundamentally about parallel availability, giving people the option to choose this or that, and it's a great thing to have for your applications to give customers the option. And uh, one of the parts of this was that we assumed that if we separated these two things, that we would be able to draw from Fedora more often for the application side, because that is. Fedora is constantly refreshing. It is a fantastic machine at, th at that. And if we can find better ways to distinguish these two buckets, then we can find better ways to pull from Fedora and deliver uh, upstream, uh, cause things to go through Fedora first, and otherwise just kind of have a greater, I hesitate to say synergy because it's one of those words, but you know, everybody gets some benefit from it. So this is, this is a thing we'd like to pursue further. Uh, that's the meaning for us. The meaning for for the uh, Fedora for community could be different. We need to figure that out together so that we get something that is you know, mutually agreeable, and then you know, update policy and, and structure and whatnot to match. And we think probably the minimization objective is the place where a lot of this pans out because when you're switching your packages up, when you're doing a subset, the, the foundation of it is that just dependencies change and the interrelationship has to be codified in the spec files. And we can't do that if we can't do it with you. Or we have to do it on the side and it's very inefficient. So that's the second thing we're looking to do. And you guess what? <laughs> we're going to have more CI. So I mentioned that uh, in uh, rel development we'd like to shorten the gap and uh, create a fast feedback loop from making a change and testing that. But while we're doing that in RHEL, like why stop at RHEL level? Why don't uh, we close the gap between making a change in upstream and uh, testing it and integrating it on a RHEL level? So why don't we uh, talk about Fedora and why don't we talk even about further going upstream? We actually want all those things. So this is one of the uh, places where we can in improve and increase our, our collaboration, not just between Fedora and Red Hat uh, and RHEL, but also between Fedora and upstream uh, projects. So this, uh, the related uh, work, or like the related objectives uh, for this uh, kind of thing is the fast lane for straightforward updates, like uh, what I call straightforward update. If something, uh, if upstream project is uh, like simple enough or introduced and in change which is simple enough, which goes, uh, you, you get it merged upstream, you con consume it in Fedora directly uh, with, with more, no changes, and then you consume it in uh, RHEL uh, with more or less no changes. And then uh, for this kind of workflow where the update can be, uh, like just doesn't require a lot of work on integration side and just you need to consume the upstream, we are going to uh, work on uh, 
setting up a fast lane for these updates. Uh, this is going to be package service. I'm not sure if Tomas is here. There will be talk about this uh, today, later on. Please see, and uh, this is a very interesting effort. So we basically, you go from top upstream to bottom in the downstream in one go by one service. This is an awesome effort to participate in, to simplify your daily work as a package maintainer. And the second part is uh, distro tests can go upstream now. Again, with the package service, with the possibility to package upstream changes immediately into the package, which can be then installed on Fedora or on RHEL, you can actually use this opportunity to test upstream changes in upstream, but test them against Fedora environment. So again, you can use Fedora uh, package service to implement this kind of test in upstream changes so that you don't have to deal with upstream breaking your Fedora stuff, but you inform upstream as they do the change that they are going to break Fedora stuff and you have the opportunity to fix that before it lands in, in the upstream even. And uh, we'd like to also provide more possibilities for teamwork. So uh, while uh, the usually historically the maintainer concept in distributions in RHEL and in Fedora is about person owning the component and our processes are focused on updating the components. We want to extend this and we want to extend gating to uh, handle multi-component updates as a unit of work. So you can uh, focus rather on um, feature you want to implement and then uh, discover which components are involved in this feature and how many work you need to do on those components. And then you can group these changes in several components into one update which you can test as, a, as one thing which you can uh, implement as one thing. So I hope this will increase the possibility for uh, maintainers to communicate and collaborate and work together focused on a larger scope, not just a, uh, the, foc uh, the scope of one individual uh, component. And this uh, maps into uh, Fedora CI objectives. Uh, if you have been following, we currently are uh, working on the multi-package gate, which will allow such things. So you will be able to group your changes in several components into one uh, unit of work from the gating point of view. All right, so we have about 20 minutes for questions, and I hope you have some. So, any questions? Yes. So the question was, why didn't we use the yum bindings that were offered in Fedora 21, 21, 22? Uh, I think so. This was this was a a deep debate within the organization. Can we just like offer another package that that kind of wraps on top? And it, it actually came down to our customer support organization and our product management organization saying that this is such a deep fundamental that the package name has to remain the same. The same command line arguments need to produce roughly the same result, you know, plus or minus what the uh, resolver came up with. So it was, it was really about maintaining continuity of customer experience. And you can't quite get that with a wrapper, even though in some sense it seems like you can. If you look at like the full end to end picture, it's not quite sufficient. They were terribly, uh, they were terribly concerned about customer scripts, right? Because at least at one point in time, I mean, we're trying more and more now to make RHEL easier to manage, easier to to install, easier to deploy, easier to manage. But many of our customers have antique infrastructure and scripts that they developed themselves and yet yeah legacy and no customer of rel runs only the newest rel right so the day rel 8 came out it wasn't like it was like like citibank was going to suddenly take rel 8 and convert their entire infrastructure to rel 8 
So they have rel five and six and seven and eight and every one of our customers is like that. And so maintaining consistency for the things that they count upon is really important. Um, if you see us working on things like Ansible system roles, that's another reason for that stuff, right? They need really a system management API and we haven't really had one across the distro. Things change, right? But, but customer infrastructure increasingly relies on automation. And so we have to give them something that they can run their automation against reliably. Yeah, and as it works out, the technical correctness is not quite as important as consistency. So compatibility really meant looking and feeling more like RHEL 7 yet also offering all these new things at the same time. So it was kind of walking a tightrope. Other questions? Jim. So everything that's in RHEL 8 is open source. We, we build it internally. If it is going into Fedora, we generally pull it from Fedora. But if nobody has actually stepped up and said, I want to maintain this in Fedora, it's not compulsory either. So I would think if it's actually a problem, has a BZ been filed? Have the maintainers been contacted? Is there like an actual request for it? Because if there is, we should address it. But if it just so happens that it's not something that's interesting to uh, the Fedora community to have, it doesn't need to be there. I personally believe when that happens, it is a bug de facto. That's just me. But is it a bug file? That particular case I happen to know is a bug, but I, would, I believe in all cases it is a bug. So we have dozens of bugs that need filed then. <laughs> All your spare time, look, right? Look, a volunteer. So, yeah. So, yeah. Kernel configs is a good example, right? I mean, intern internal to Red Hat, the kernel team goes through. I mean, they're they're. Oh, sorry. So, how do we rationalize things like like differences in kernel configurations, probably KVM configurations, stuff like that, where some things are appropriate for Fedora, and you know, where where the hardware environment is totally different, right? And, and some things are more appropriate for the enterprise class, big honk and hardware, that you, you typically find um, as you go out and have to do things more at scale. The kernel team reviews the configurations, and there are hundreds of kernel options that you can choose, right? And every one of them that you choose causes changes, large and small, in what that kernel turns out looking like. And so there's an exhaustive review conducted internal to Red Hat by the kernel team, they have to look at what they think is ready upstream, what they think is still buggy, um, things that, so they also, they review like, is this crufty old hardware that we don't want to support anymore? Or crufty, so, old, hardware that our, or crufty old hardware that our customers still demand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and oftentimes um, the hardware support that you would want in Fedora, where a lot of it's going to be deployed on laptops, on workstations, is not at all what you want to deploy on a Superdome, right? Um, and so the kernel team does a big review working with the performance team. 
and they figure out, they run lots and lots of performance testing and figure out what is going to be the best compromise. And then they put together Tune D profiles to help customers get to a working configuration for themselves as well. Uh, if, if, if I may add, yeah, the uh, actual, um, the, where is the effort in the kernel? I, I talked about uh, bring, uh, closing the gap between upstream and rel in testing and in CI, but uh, this also works for kernel. So we actually working now to bring in uh, rel based kernel tests to the upstream. And so we are looking forward for making more impact on upstream with those testing, with those uh, infrastructure, and we hope that uh, we will be um, uh, less divergent uh, from the upstream and from Fedora in the rel, uh, in rel kernel as well. So there's going to be an effort to actually minimize the set of differences between Fedora and rel kernel so we don't maintain like completely different uh, trees for that. This is also like nicely tied to CI and gating story. And it actually is uh, in development, in, in progress right now, and probably Laura uh, Abbott is the best person to talk about it. So, yeah, so she's given a talk uh, today in a, after the lunch, so try to find it if you're interested in, in this in more detail. Okay, and just rounding that one out, sometimes there is a good reason to have one build that does one thing and one build that does another thing. Like, we have... We have system-wide compiler flags that we use for, for every architecture. What if you want variation on that? Basically, if you only have one build, if you only have one compose, then you only have one option. But if there is some way that we can develop RHEL in a shared space, we could do experiments where we have a second build with a second set of options, and people could try one, try the other, do what works for them. So it's definitely an area we'd like to explore. And clearly that is something that you can only do when you have a really good suite of automated tests. Yes. Go, Alexandra. <laughs> it's all about robots. Okay, so that wasn't exactly a question, but I will try and paraphrase. Like <laughs> Neil is uh, Neil Gumpo is saying that uh, uh, it will be helpful to have uh, more avenues with with greater transparency in the rel uh, development process. It would be helpful to have more transparency and input uh, from people who are able to uh, test uh, in, in advance to to provide feedback on changes. Um, obviously, you know, rel has a, a public beta program for every release that already exists, but are there ways to uh, build on that, improve on it, offer more in advance? I think so. Do I know exactly how that would work? Not at the moment, but I would say stay tuned, right? We're, this is definitely of, of interest, I think, to the, um, the raw product folks. Oh, is, yeah, sorry, I, yeah, I, I, I was thinking about it and didn't vocalize it, which is, would there be a way for people to actually contribute patches, contribute uh, uh, specific fixes or inputs back, back into the, and, and tests back into the process? Um, yeah, I think that would be very useful, uh, right? The, the, that's kind of the spirit of open source, and I think if you're gonna have a more open RHEL process, I think it makes sense to build that kind of, uh, that kind of, of, of procedure into it as well. 
just before we move on, I just want to make sure I didn't. All right, I didn't get fired for that, so that's great. <laughs> that's, it's always good. Like, I, I'll know right away. Like, I'll get kicked under the table, yeah. and that's how I'll know. And then, uh, yeah, my, my resume is ready, so it's okay. Dominic, uh, go ahead. So let me, all right, I'll, I'll paraphrase again for the, for the cameras. Uh, Dominic pointed out that part of the reason for having uh, more of the testing moving upstream is that it gives people an immediate route that doesn't really lock on Fedora as a community or RHEL as a product, that really moving those things upstream is a benefit to the entire open source community. And that's something that Fedora holds dear, right? I mean, this is exactly what we've been saying for many years is that we try and drive changes upstream. And I think the, the expanded upstream testing and CI, that is an expression a better expression of that than maybe what we have been doing for, for many years. So I think it's something we should keep an eye on is that you know, Fedora doesn't become uh, sort of its own concentration of, uh, of value that it doesn't need to hold. In other words, that we're not uh, maybe uh, inadvertently hoarding change or inadvertently hoarding value into Fedora that we don't need to. So driving that work upstream is really important. Uh, just to add on, on top of it, so is from strategic point of view, it's uh, better to have the initial verification as early as possible because for when you try to provide feedback to RHEL, it might be too too late in the process. So uh, the main like idea which you need to keep in mind is that the first verification st is f happens in upstream or in Fedora. And the goal of rel verification is mostly to make sure that we uh, that things still work. So it's not the, the first time we check that things work. We, we in rel we, we check that things still are working the same way it's supposed to be. So this is our major goal. Well, just checking of new things is uh, going to be more upstream, more uh, commu uh, community project based, and and so on. We are. We still have some gaps, like w when we diverge too much, when we can introduce something. But we are going to be closing this, and this is one of the efforts that we are using upstream tests and tests in RHEL to recheck that we didn't break all the things upstream did while we were integrating it in RHEL. So this is going to be still working. Yeah. And maybe if I, if I could add just one bit of color, this is just maybe a philosophical thing. Um, I'm sure how valuable it is, but I think when you look at, at how RHEL diverges from upstream, um, I wouldn't say that over the years we've gotten particularly better from major release to major release about that. Like there is a gap, there continues to be a gap in each product. I would say that it has not gotten particularly worse, but it also hasn't gotten particularly better. But I do feel that as, uh, as a development organization, we continue to apply pressure on that gap and that's why it has not gotten worse because I think the tendency when an organization is not keeping open source principles in mind would be that that gap is going to get wider naturally over time and the fact that we've kept it about where it is you know just just in this sort of you know maybe meta philosophical way is I think evidence of the fact that a lot of people think about this in, inside Red Hat so I, I'm really grateful to, to work in an organization that that thinks about that but I, I think again we're always trying to do better whether we succeed in the end or not at, at, at closing that gap down I think if we do if we do no better than keeping it the same that is evidence of a lot of effort hopefully we can though you know we can close that gap more over the over the next two years All right, anybody else? All right, and then just one follow-up on Jim's question, observing that there are some packages that are in RHEL, but not in Fedora. For, for those packages, if we wanted to have RHEL develop more and open, more transparently, more visibly, it would definitely be a bug, because how can you have it be a, a subset of Fedora if it's not all there? So please file bugs. Anybody else? Cool. Well, 
Thank you all for coming. And thank you, panel. Thank you, panel.